The diffusion of innovation theory was coined in the 1962 book Diffusion of Innovations by Everett Rogers, a professor of communication studies and a sociologist. This theory posits that innovations are communicated through a social system at a rate determined by the variability in the communication methods available, the social system medium in which the communication is occurring, the qualities of the innovation itself, and the period of time that has elapsed since the innovation was introduced. Among other inventions, in this book, Rogers coined the phrases innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards to broadly define the rate at which different groups latch on to new innovations. These terms became incredibly useful to marketers, who often use them as a means of delineating adoption demographics, allowing them to target those who would be most likely to, for instance, try out edgy, unproven products or services, or to understand at what point the bulk of a population might hop on board and try something new. How long it takes for the early adopters to reach critical mass so that the early and late majority feel comfortable buying that new gadget or trying out that new health craze. Everett Rogers' book was the consequence of his efforts to synthesize new meaning from work that had been previously conducted by many other people in fields ranging from anthropology to education to medical sociology to his specialty, rural sociology. His ideas initially found an audience amongst those hoping to increase the speed at which American farms industrialized helping them figure out what combination of the right messages in the right years, regulations passed by official government bodies, and availability of new technologies like mechanization and hybrid seeds in a region would allow them to optimally adopt new methods of food production that seemed to be working well elsewhere, but which were proving tricky to spread to risk-averse areas filled with risk-averse farmers. The same general goals were held by those who hoped to use Rogers' work within the medical field, using it to analyze at what point new treatments, technologies, and health-related information should be brought into an area, in what order, and via whom, locally, to ensure that the most successful healthcare filtered from areas where it already existed and was widely adopted to those where fear of the unknown generally kept such things from being accepted by the locals. This theory has also been widely applied within government and other organizational bodies to determine how best to establish positive norms, whatever positive might mean to that particular community, in sprawling interconnected teams. There was a paper published in 2010 that tackled the topic of changing norms within international institutions, which used the World Bank and their desire to increase the perceived importance of human rights within the organization, as an example. Human rights were already vaguely important to this group, but it wasn't a primary focus for everyone, and those in charge hoped to change that. But because the World Bank, like many similarly scaled organizations, is sprawling and factionalized, they had to feed the idea into the system intentionally, hitting the right people with it at the right moments, and they had to attach the concept to incentives that would cause it to become a priority for, at first, certain influencers, and then, secondarily, those who attached to the fringe of new ideas, and then, tertiarily, the early majority, and so on. This was a tricky project to tackle, because while some people in the organization, like lawyers, saw human rights as a worthwhile end unto itself, others, like the resident economists, saw it as more of a means to another end, like improved economic development. Being able to sync these causes and align these perceptions, then, was no small task. It required they associate new ideas with older, well-established ideas, that they identify and target people who could serve as champions for the idea and who would act as vectors for it 
within their particular department. And it required that departmentally relevant information about the idea was disseminated in such a way that multiple people could champion the cause in different fashions without feeling they'd been manipulated. What I want to talk about today is also related to innovation and how it spreads, but it also pulls us into some of the conflicts that arise as ideas proliferate and evolve over time. Today, we're going to dive into the tricky topic of cultural appropriation. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is a listener-supported show, meaning it is brought to you by you. If you go to letsknowthings.com and click on the contribute page, you will find a list of different ways that you can help support the show. Many of them are quick and free, including leaving a review up on iTunes or sharing the show with a friend. You can also contribute monetarily if you care to via PayPal or Venmo, or you can go over to the newly founded LKT Patreon page if you go to patreon.com slash let's know things. Among other benefits that patrons on Patreon enjoy is an ad-free version of the show each week. So if that is compelling to you, consider stopping over there and taking a look. And another great way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors. The first of which today is Lynda. Lynda Lynda.com is a website for learning all kinds of things from software to music theory. If you've been meaning to learn Photoshop or want to learn to code, it is an excellent option. And if you go to letsknowthings.com slash Lynda, L-Y-N-D-A, you will receive a free 30-day trial. And the other sponsor today is Everlane, my favorite clothing company. If you go to letsknowthings.com slash Everlane, you will be taken to their website. And if you make a purchase while there, that will also help support the show. I will receive a commission for that. So I would never encourage you to buy anything that you do not need. That is kind of counter to the philosophy here. But if you are looking for a new shirt or some shoes or something like that, and the aesthetic is appealing to you, consider shopping via letsknowthings.com slash Everlane. And that will potentially expose you to some new, wonderful clothing options, but it will also help support the show. All right, let's get back to the show. The article that I want to start with this week comes from the Washington Post, and it's entitled, Should White Chefs Sell Burritos? A Portland Food Cart's Revealing Controversy. So up front, I want to mention that this article is an editorial piece from the food section of the Washington Post. So there's a healthy dose of subjectivity embedded within it. It is not a clean, unbiased recitation of data. And interestingly, a piece from the Portland Mercury news site that seems to have inspired this piece, at least in part, has since been taken down from that site with a note from the editor saying that new information has come to light and that the article's position was not factually supported. That piece that was removed was entitled This Week in Appropriation, Kooks Burritos and Willamette Week, and an excerpt from that piece quoted in the Washington Post editorial says the following, quote, Because of Portland's underlying racism, The people who rightly own these traditions and cultures that exist are already treated poorly. These appropriating businesses are erasing and exploiting their already marginalized identities for the purpose of profit and praise. I don't know exactly what information from that article eventually led to its being pulled, but it's somewhat convenient that it was in a way, because this is a hot button issue. And there's more than a little bit of trepidation present when anyone brings it up. And that quote is a pretty good setup for the rest of the piece in the post, which discusses efforts that are being made in Portland to counter cases of cultural appropriation, including a publicly available web-based spreadsheet that lists restaurants owned by white people who have 
quote, appropriated cuisines outside their own culture, end quote, along with a list of alternative nearby restaurants with more culturally aligned owners for readers to consider. The famous Portland donut shop, Voodoo Donuts, gets a mention on that list, and the rationale is that the donut shop is profiting off a religion that combines African, Catholic, and Native American traditions, but it is owned by white people. The Washington Post article goes on to mention other places that could, by that standard, be considered culturally appropriative, but which have received nothing but accolades from members of the cultures from whence the food being served was originally derived. Josh Phillips is white and the co-owner of Espita Mescaleria, which is a restaurant and bar dedicated to cuisine and alcohol from Oaxaca, Mexico. The 65 staff who work there are all full-timers who are paid well and have health benefits. The four full-time tortilla makers go out of their way to use only heirloom corn from Mexico, 99% of which is imported from Oaxaca. The owners also pledged to never sell mezcal, a Mexican liquor, from corporate distillers, instead sourcing their drinks from traditional mezcaleros. The author of this piece goes on to describe this restaurant and other places like it as examples of something more akin to cultural ambassadorship than cultural appropriation. But again, by some standards, by some definitions of cultural appropriation, there is no distinction between a place like Espita Mescaleria and a restaurant that does far less to share some of the profits they earn with people from the culture and geographic regions where the food and drink they're serving was originally developed. This discussion and the conflict surrounding it is not just happening in places like Portland, Oregon, which is a lot more Caucasian than a lot of other cities its size in the U.S., but also a lot more left-leaning politically. This is something that's occurring around the world, and increasingly so, as we are more capable of looking around and seeing what other people are doing, but also as we're experiencing ever greater amounts of cross-pollination between different cultures. And as a result of that cross-pollination, the lines between cultures are no longer quite as clear as they once were. There was a moment in time, much of history, to varying degrees, in which we were fairly well divided by our geography, but that is no longer the case today. The term cultural appropriation, depending on who you're speaking to, may evoke empathetic and forlorn head nodding, or a sigh and a disbelieving shaking of the head. Some people are fired up about it, angrily retweeting the latest instance of some celebrity wearing a Native American headdress in an Instagram shot, while others view it as one more example of politically correct busybodies trying to find something to be angry about. There are frantic shock pieces published about this topic regularly, and a lot of the work produced by folks on both sides of the debate tend to be dismissive of the arguments from the other end of the spectrum. As a result, it can be difficult to ascertain why you should believe one side or the other, as both tend to be more concerned about scoring virtue points and making their audience feel superior outrage than expressing anything useful about their opinion on the matter. That said, it's probably a good idea to take a moment to look at the central arguments on both sides. The cultural appropriation is an important thing we should be worried about camp's argument generally focuses on the power dynamic between groups of people and how the privilege of one group can cause their actions to be perceived differently and can cause those actions to have entirely different consequences than similar acts committed by other groups at different places on the privilege scale. There's an essay on a blog called Unsettling America that I found to be very level-headed in its presentation and very self-aware about the claim it was making. It made some good arguments without dismissing the other side's claims as evil or clearly out of touch. The piece is called What's the Difference Between Cultural Exchange and Cultural Appropriation? And a quote from that piece says this, quote, One of the reasons that cultural appropriation is a hard concept to grasp for so many 
is that Westerners are used to pressing their own culture onto others and taking what they want in return. We tend to think of this as cultural exchange when really it's no more an exchange than pressuring your neighbors to adopt your ideals while stealing their family heirlooms. End quote. It goes on to say, quote, the fact is Western culture invites and at times demands assimilation. Not every culture has chosen to open itself up to being adopted by outsiders in the same way. End quote. And then finally it says, quote, so as free as people should be to wear whatever hair and clothing they enjoy, using someone else's cultural symbols to satisfy a personal need for self-expression is an exercise in privilege. Because for those of us who have felt forced and pressured to change the way we look, behave, and speak just to earn enough respect to stay employed and safe, our modes of self-expression are still limited. African American vernacular English is consistently treated as lesser than standard English, but people whitewash black slang and use expressions they barely understand as punchlines or to make themselves seem cool. People shirk ethnic clothes in corporate culture, but wear bastardized versions of them on Halloween. There is no exchange, understanding, or respect in such cases, only taking. End quote. This line of argument helps clarify the hazy line between exchange and appropriation that can seem to be arbitrarily placed at times, or at least it can seem hazy sometimes to someone like me, a person for whom, because of my place and time of birth and the color of my skin and numerous other fundamental traits that I was born into, needn't ever think about culture or heritage if I don't want to. How is one to know when cultural exchange is taking place as opposed to cultural appropriation? It would seem, by this argument at least, that a solid heuristic is that when the cultural mores being adopted are caricatured or simplified for resale, or when the person adopting is taking only half-heartedly, picking and choosing, while also demanding that the person they're adopting from assimilate norms that they are more comfortable with, be that a way of talking or a style of dress or anything else, then there's a pretty good chance that what you're looking at is cultural appropriation, not cultural exchange. Now, there are a lot of different versions of this argument, and some people draw the line at a very different place, but this was the one that seemed most clear to me. As someone who has had to learn this concept by research and wrote, rather than being exposed to it in such a way that it's become clear from personal experience, as is the case for many, many people. There are other arguments out there that may make more sense to you, and I highly recommend checking out some of those other explanations and definitions if you want to learn more, or if this concept is still unclear. I will link to some of those other arguments in the show notes. But on the other side of the spectrum is the argument that the concept of cultural appropriation is, for all intents and purposes, utter nonsense. In short, those who spend their time worrying over cultural appropriation are either intentionally and enthusiastically rabble-rousing to gain attention for themselves or their constituency, are suffering from sour grapes and wanting to claim some of the innovations made by other cultures as their own, despite having had no hand in them, or are misunderstanding the way economics work and how invention and cultural innovation occurs and spreads. One of the more useful pieces in this vein, to me, was published in The Atlantic, and interestingly, it wasn't a cultural appropriation is bullshit sort of piece, but rather a discussion between Atlantic writer Connor Friedersdorf and Cato Institute scholar Jonathan Blanks about a recent hubbub at the Whitney Museum over a painting by a woman named Dana Schutz entitled Open Casket. The painting depicts the body of a 14-year-old boy named Emmett Till who was lynched in 1955, and whose death was one of the galvanizing events leading up to the civil rights movement. Just as the piece from the Unsettling America blog was more convincing to me than pieces that ignore the arguments of the other side, this piece struck me as more convincing because it was willing to not just acknowledge that there are other opinions, 
but also acknowledge the legitimacy of many of these other arguments while still presenting opposing perspectives. And the main point being made here, though there are many interesting side points made, the piece is definitely worth a read and I will link to it in the show notes, is that the term cultural appropriation has lost a lot of its meaning and utility because of the way it's been applied, broadly encompassing everything from white people dressing up in blackface and making fun of African American culture to something like a non-Japanese chef preparing sushi. The language we are using to discuss this and similar topics is failing us. And as a result, people are grouping things like a genuine desire to understand and benefit from the knowledge and history of another culture with other things like a restaurant serving fried chicken and watermelon to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day, which is a thing that actually happened. These are two very different ways to approach the multicultural nature of the modern world, but the term cultural appropriation is being used for both, as well as other wildly different circumstances. And as such, the term itself has become highly suspect and causes us to demonize well-meaning people while allowing immensely racist and more directly harmful issues to slip under the radar. There are other arguments that are further out on both polar extremes of this conversation, but I'm not going to get into those here. To me, it's frankly just kind of intellectually lazy to rant about social justice warrior snowflakes not able to take a joke, or on the flip side saying that anyone who prepares or eats food that originates from outside, what someone else has decided is their cultural lane, is being racist. This flavor of rallying cry and often shouted argument gets a lot of play on social media and blogs and even the occasional otherwise serious and legitimate news publication. But I think that's more about stirring outrage and attracting clicks than an honest attempt to present coherent arguments that are meant to be taken seriously by anyone but the most inattentive consumer of politically slanted current events analysis. And truth be told, this topic is difficult to discuss concisely if you want to have a real discussion about it, rather than simply hurling slogans at each other. There are a lot of quick-fix arguments coming from both sides, all of which can seem to make sense in your gut, but which may not make much sense if you extrapolate and actually think things through more thoroughly. And perhaps most frustratingly, there's no absolute concrete answer that applies in all situations. That will make sense to all people. So the most you can hope for is to understand the discussion and some of its context, and then use that knowledge to form your own opinion in situ, case by case. So that fundamental groundwork laid, I'm going to go off on what seems like a bit of a tangent here, but bear with me. I promise it connects back, and it is relevant. There was an editorial in the New York Times recently by a woman who has a type of dwarfism. She and her children all have a genetic illness called X-linked hypophosphatemia, or XLH for short, which gives those who have this illness a short stature, crooked legs, poor teeth, and other physical adjustments that many would consider to be disabilities. This piece is entitled, Trying to Embrace the Cure, because there's apparently a treatment that will be available to the public very soon that amounts to a cure for this condition. A recombinant antibody called KRN23 has been shown to restrict the production of a hormone that keeps those who have XLH from absorbing phosphorus, which is the root of the physical issues that they suffer. People who grow up with XLH have many concerns that many other people do not have. They're forced to have bone surgeries and wear special braces and take vitamin D2 supplements if they want to avoid more serious problems that those who have had the condition in prior generations have suffered. As a result, a sort of subculture has emerged within the community of people who have XLH. And this community, this collection of similar and shared experiences amongst this group of people who often have little else in common, is enough to give the author mixed feelings about the cure. This quote from that piece describes her thoughts on the matter better than I can. Quote, 
By all this, I do not mean to say that the prospect of a cure for XLH is a bad thing, only that for people like me, it is a complex one. Certainly, the potential benefits to both individuals and society are real. Less struggle and suffering for individuals and families, especially those not financially and socially equipped to overcome them, and perhaps the chance to direct medical attention and limited resources to more life-threatening and debilitating conditions. But that does not change the fact that to be human often entails finding ways to make what appears a disadvantage a point of strength or pride. XLH does not shorten lifespan. It makes walking difficult, and we XLHers suffer more aches and pains than most people. We also look different. When I was a child, this was the main reason I longed for a cure, so I could look like everyone else. Now, it is the part of my XLH I cling to a little stubbornly. Why, I hesitate and wonder, who would I be without my XLH? Who would my children be? End quote. This reminds me, in some ways, of the debate about the promise of cochlear implants for deaf people. To portions of the deaf community, this device, which offers partial hearing to those who have it installed, has resulted in controversy amongst those for whom the deaf community is, well, their community. And it's a community, like any community, that was built around shared struggles and social norms. Many of these shared elements, however, disappear, at least to some degree, when a member begins to hear, and resultantly becomes a part of the hearing community as well. Because the people in this community are individuals, quite different from one another in almost every other way except this one thing, the deafness that ties them together, what, then, becomes of their relationships, their shared experiences and concerns? when that common attribute goes away. The question then becomes, if you're a parent, do you get a cochlear implant for your deaf child? Do you give them the same perceived advantages of the majority, or do you allow them to choose later, once they've had the chance to grow as part of another, smaller community that would nonetheless welcome them with open arms? Likewise, if you know your children will have their growth stunted, and numerous related bodily issues as a result of inhibited phosphorus absorption. Do you immediately give them the cure, or do you allow them to first gain entry into a smaller, but perhaps quite valuable and meaningful community of people who share those struggles, even if entry means, well, that they have to struggle, means they experience perhaps more pain than other children might experience. These are topics that are complex and difficult to navigate and discuss even in many ways. And this difficulty is partially because from the outside, to those who did not grow up deaf, the idea of being deaf is a horrible thought. Valuing deafness and valuing being a part of the deaf community might be something that we can intellectually wrap our minds around and maybe see the benefits of, but Deafness itself would still seem like an affliction, and the idea of not giving the perceived advantage of a cochlear implant to your child would probably seem bizarre and even abusive to some non-deaf people. Why not give your child every advantage if you know that they will struggle and maybe even suffer if you leave them without those advantages? Now let's attempt to apply that same reasoning elsewhere. When I first moved to Bangkok many years ago, I lived there in 2010, I believe, one of the most bizarre things about the culture, to me, and there were many things that stood out as bizarre to a guy from the US who had moved to Thailand, but one of the most memorably bizarre was finding that grocery store aisles there are lined with dozens of different brands of whitening lotions, essentially skin bleaching chemicals that were meant to make a person look paler, maybe more Caucasian. As a pale Caucasian guy myself, who dreaded hot summers and the sunburns that they would inevitably bring when I was a kid, this whole concept made very little sense to me. But over time I learned about how socially advantageous it was to be whiter, to be paler within Thai society. Whiteness was considered to be a very beautiful trait. A person who was whiter was assumed to be wealthier, 
and more socially influential. Couldn't it be argued, then, that knowing this, knowing how much of an advantage it can be to be paler, to be as white as possible within this society, that it's actually somewhat cruel to allow your child to be dark-skinned? Shouldn't a parent do their best to ensure they have pristine, porcelain-hued little offspring, lest they subject their kids to a life of increased struggle and perhaps even pain? Doesn't that align in some ways with our perception about how parents should definitely give their deaf children cochlear implants? Through this lens, through the lens of applying those same standards to skin color and the social perception of skin color, to me at least the issue of cochlear implants and the treatment for XLH seems a little less clear-cut than it did before. And it becomes even more complicated if you take that thought experiment a step further. What if scientists came up with a procedure that could change your looks in any way you might please? If you could, for instance, seem in every way to be of Caucasian descent, when in reality you are of Nigerian descent. Or maybe you could take on the typical physical attributes of a person of Han Chinese heritage, when in actuality your lineage is Vietnamese. Prejudices and biases, and even well-meaning but still influential on our lives preconceived notions, being what they are, would we be in dereliction of our parental duties to not imbue our children with the most favored attributes possible to give them those advantages. There are a lot of systemic benefits and privileges that come with being a white person in many places around the world, and a lot of systemic barriers a black person and other people of color must leap over or find a way around in those same places. Using the logic of it being cruel not to provide our children with every advantage, with cochlear implants, wouldn't it also be cruel not to make our black children white? Now, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. That's a pretty messed up thing to think about, isn't it? It's a messed up thing to say, certainly, and I'm thankful that I have this medium of discussion for topics like this because sometimes messed up thought experiments help illustrate how difficult a topic can be to even think about, much less have a meaningful conversation about. So it's no wonder that most news entities have trouble addressing this topic roundly and the, the many facets of this story, because not only is it multi-layered and context-heavy, it is also riddled with landmines. Every single component of this conversation is potentially offensive and hurtful and cringe-inducing. And part of the difficulty in addressing topics like this stems from a vast gulf between the perceptions and experiences of the people involved. I've never been deaf, so to me, the idea that I would want to remain deaf when I had the option of getting something like a cochlear implant, which would allow me to hear, seems ridiculous. Even understanding the community aspect of the argument, I still can't feel on a deeper level the commitment to that shared struggle and set of concerns, and any of the benefits that no doubt exist for people within that community. So the full picture is not apparent to me. It is not available for me to feel. As such, I could have that discussion with someone who is deaf, and we could very easily talk right past each other, neither of us fully understanding what the other person values and what they're trying to protect. Any argument I could make about the benefits of hearing would likely be unconvincing to someone who is similarly surprised that I cannot see the benefits of the culture they would be in many ways leaving behind if they were to enter the non-deaf world. If you can understand this, why someone would not necessarily choose to administer a cure or device that would allow them to hear, then you can also understand the concept and importance of cultural identity. Or rather, you can understand why we value cultural identity so highly, even when, in some cases, the identity we value so highly keeps us separate from other communities and potentially comes with its own downsides. Cultural identity is often 
but not always connected to race, nationality, faith, social class, and other things that we are typically born into, but also things that we segue into intentionally, chosen things that we dawn at some point in our lives. One example of a cultural identity might be German, another might be emo, another might be Western upper middle class, still another might be modern, self-aware, independent female professional. One's cultural identity is partially an internal feeling and partially an outward adherence to certain norms. We feel a kinship with others of our ilk. But we may also dress a certain way, speak with a certain inflection, hang out with a particular group, take on certain types of work, and so on. The way these traits are presented, and whether they're presented at all, outwardly, varies depending on the person. Not all Central European Christians act the same way, believe the exact same things, or have much in common beyond a broad set of general foundational beliefs and a vague sense of shared history. The things they do share can be used to make them feel closer to one another, and can even serve as an excuse for people who might not otherwise get along to perceive each other as friends, not enemies or strangers. This same tendency can also be used to pit one group against another group, despite the individuals involved not having any real issue with each other. Fans of different sports teams may not have any reason to dislike each other as individuals, but their respective memberships as fans of these teams to that community of fans and the expectations that come with those memberships may see them at each other's throats more often than not. A requirement of this particular cultural identity, then, might be that you hate the rival team because they obviously suck while your team is obviously awesome, regardless of what the stats might say. If we see ourselves as part of a particular culture, whether that culture is defined by our genetic heritage, our geographic region or religious upbringing, our ability to hear or not hear, or which video game console we prefer, there's a tendency to see the victories of one member of our group as our victory as well. Likewise, we perceive the suffering of people from our group, contemporarily or in the past, as our own suffering. An African American alive today is unlikely to have been enslaved, but the cultural resonance of what happened to other people from their community not long ago may still leave an indelible and important mark. It might very well be a more meaningful thing to a person from that group than simply being aware that this is something horrible that happened in history would otherwise account for. Similarly, there's animus between neighboring ethnic groups around the world, not because of anything that's happened lately, but because someone's ancestors messed with someone else's ancestors, and that sense of tribal memory of historical empathy within one's community lives on. This bond within our communities allows us to care for each other and work collectively. It allows us to feel impassioned about our sports teams and the battles that our forefathers fought. It incentivizes us to remember and maintain the lessons of the past and to do new, great things in the future to increase not just our own reputation, but that of the community of which we are a part. If your culture, then, accomplished something beneficial or interesting at some point in its history, it stands to reason that you might become a little irritated if that thing were to be claimed by someone else from some other group. Even if it's not directly claimed, but only seems to be claimed, for example, if your community invented the taco, but some dude outside your community gets the credit for it, that could come across as a pretty solid slap to the collective face, even if no one involved intended it to be. That slap would probably be even more painful if the guy getting all the credit for your taco invention is part of a community that is on average more privileged than your own. Perhaps he comes from a group that is more often socially favored, like white people, or from a group that has more economic power, like the upper middle class. Notably, it wouldn't even necessarily matter if the guy who's getting all the credit for the taco is himself as an individual wealthier 
or more socially favored than you or the average member of your community. That his community is, though, makes this situation hard to tolerate, as his often more favored on average community now has one more feather in their cap. And this feather, by your reckoning, has been unearned and perhaps even stolen from another group that deserves to have that recognition. And at the very least, some share of the accolades being divvied out, be they monetary or simply recognition-based rewards. It's this relationship that we have with our communities, in part, that makes having a discussion about cultural appropriation difficult. Cultural exchange is something that is happening and will keep happening. And I would argue that it's an immensely beneficial thing. The riffing on past work, on things our shared human forebears have created and learned, is important. It's how we grow as a species, non-delineated by all these other labels we apply to ourselves. But it's important to remember that a lot of these labels, these communities, are not 100% self-imposed. We are grouped by others. We are treated differently because of attributes that we have. And as a result, we may technically be a part of that larger human community, but we are also segregated into other smaller communities. Communities of people who are sorted by the same attributes and who have been treated differently because of them. Communities they didn't necessarily choose to be lumped into, but which they have maybe decided to own regardless. They've had walls thrown up around them, and they've decided to paint those walls and put up some tapestries that show heroic and impressive events from their community's past. Because why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you own and change negative stigmas about a group you're a part of, given the opportunity? Why wouldn't you celebrate your shared history and aspire to add to that heritage that is now a part of who you are? Of course, none of the communities we're part of, willingly or unwillingly, actually define us as individuals. The collective history and accomplishments of white Americans doesn't say anything about who I am as a person, any more than the Chinese or Dutch or Native American community's accomplishments apply to any individual from these groups 100%. What we get from these stories, from these mimetic cultural attributes that are handed down from generation to generation, is a sense of belonging, a feeling of resiliency, and a reminder of what's come before. It's a sort of pride that rubs off on those of us who perhaps haven't actually done anything, much like the pride we feel when the sports team we cheer for wins an important match. It's a valuable transmission of a feeling of worth between generations. It's a sense that we are part of something greater, that we stem from a worthy lineage and one that's worth propagating, that we should continue to add to. Which is part of why it is such a slap to the face when we feel something our cultural ancestors added to the world is being claimed or seems to be claimed by someone else, someone from outside our community. The rewards, both tangible and reputational, are accumulating elsewhere, and we feel robbed. The rationale behind wanting to keep one's cultural achievements relegated to those from within the culture in question makes sense within the context of wanting one's descendants to benefit from one's risks, work, and investments. If your great-great-grandparents spend decades figuring out the exact blend of spices for a kick-ass type of sauce that they made, it's conceivable that they might want the beneficiaries of that knowledge to be their own flesh and blood, their peers and neighbors, but also their children and their children's children, those who share the same blood, but also who share the same values and traditions. Our biologies predispose us to want to pass on our genetic attributes, but also our cultural DNA. Our genes and our memes want to live on. And from some scientific perspectives, we humans and all living things are really just fancy delivery systems for these bits of data, delivering them into the future. And that latent desire to pass on this information includes ensuring those offspring children and ideas survive and thrive, out-competing the same from other people and cultures. The reality that we face, though, is that sauce recipes are easily transmittable and replicatable, more so now than ever, and the idea that an amazing sauce should be prepared only by certain people because of where those people happen to have been born 
or who their parents' parents happened to be, is a little strange. At least it seems strange by most modern, globalized standards. But then, I would argue this same disposition wouldn't seem as strange if applied to other developments, other inventions, and innovations. If my great-great-grandparents invented a clever pot that could be used to prepare sauces, and they patented that design, then there's a good chance that I and my family, and perhaps my community, would monetarily and reputationally benefit from that invention. And we would probably even be legally protected by the government to ensure we continue to benefit from it. There are limitations on this in terms of what can be patented and for how long, but the point is that some types of creation are more likely to be protected and held sacred by the systems we have in place, while others are more liberally shared without consequence and without regard for financial compensation for the creators or their descendants. How we judge which is which varies from country to country, but in general, what we might loosely define as culturally important innovations, like styles of music or sauce recipes, are not protected, while what we might loosely define as commerce-related inventions are protected. There's a latent advantage held by those who are favored within commercial systems, and that systemic privilege is amplified as the innovations of some are protected, while the innovations of others are shared with little or no consideration for the innovator. This is one possible reason why so many Caucasian chefs become famous and well compensated for their restaurants that specialize in Mexican, Chinese, and other foods from outside their cultural traditions. It's not necessarily that they're producing those foods any better than those who invented them. It could be that they simply have more access to financial resources, media opportunities, and validation within relevant professional forums compared to those who developed that cuisine originally or who come from the culture that did. Of course, in some cases, there's no doubt that a new set of eyes and hands and a new perspective can change and even improve upon, by some standards anyway, a type of food. When a chef riffs on cuisine from outside their home culture, they are bringing something new to it, and the results of this can be wonderful. Not all fusion cuisine is stellar, nor is every smaller modification made to a traditional recipe over time, but arguably one of the best things about interactions between cultures is the resultant hyper-evolution of cultural artifacts and mores as they cross borders and pass from community to community. It's possible to appreciate food for its purity of form and adherence to traditional structure, while also appreciating food that's novel, interesting, strange, challenging. It's possible to love the hell out of a pasta sauce made from a recipe that was passed down from generation to generation to generation, while also digging the science-infused whatever being produced at the gastropub down the street, where everything on their menu is new and lacks a recognizable cultural heritage. These two approaches are not mutually exclusive, and they only come into conflict when we decide the world must be pure, with everyone staying in their own lane, or that nothing traditional is worth maintaining and passing on from age to age. We can have our traditional pasta sauce atop our new age spiraled eggplant noodles. We are allowed to enjoy both. For this to work ideally, though, we need to figure out how to show appreciation for and commemorate the contributions of different individuals and groups who create amazing things that never seem to get much recognition or credit, or who have their contributions buried and replaced by other, newer, more popular or powerful creators. There was a white supremacist that I had a few classes with when I was attending university, and sometimes he would get drunk and talk about how white people are the only ones to have ever done anything of value. He justified his view by saying that other races did not show proper respect for all that the white race had given them. Now, this is a perspective that, just on every level, is hilariously false, but it's understandable how some people might come to see the world that way if all they are ever exposed to are white people-fronted innovations and improvements, things that seem to have come from white people and only white people, when in reality, Elvis Presley may have made a certain type of music popular to the mainstream, but he certainly did not invent it. I'm willing to bet that 
few of the white chefs who open up Mexican restaurants have anything but respect for the culture that they've come to know and riff on, but their intentions and thoughts are not necessarily the issue here. It's the way their presence in that field is perceived by others, and how the rewards generally do not trickle down to those upon whose shoulders they're standing. It's unlikely there will ever be laws on the books that illegalize Caucasians running Mexican restaurants, or Japanese people producing hip-hop albums, or Russians publishing books of traditional oceanic folktales. It's a safe bet that humanity would be much worse off if something like this were to happen, because our traditions and inventions and stories would be siloed and sequestered, and would probably fall prey to defensiveness and the slow erosion of forced traditionalism. That said, the globalization genie is out of the bottle, and our exposure to each other spreads information and trends and cultural norms and innovations in a similar way that our bodies, that our biologies, spread germs. Which is to say that there will continue to be more sharing, mixing, and mashing up of all kinds of things. That's the nature of the 21st century on planet Earth, and it's unlikely anything we do is going to stop that. Even with the best of arguments, which I'm not convinced exist, but even if very solid, let's keep things how they are and everyone stay in their own lane arguments did exist, making such a desire a reality is likely an unattainable fantasy. Cultural purists, for today at least, are out of luck. But that doesn't mean we can't figure out ways to commemorate what was as we create what will be. Wouldn't it be interesting if there was a way to trace cultural influence backward to create a sort of ancestral lineage map that would show you how the music you're listening to right now evolved over time and where the initial inspiration came from, perhaps hundreds of years in the past? Maybe something that allows you to also be exposed to the more pure versions of what you're listening to, but which could also expose you to other branches of that tree, to the cultural cousins, the other descendants of that genre that you're digging. Wouldn't it be interesting if, similarly, some of the royalties for that song could filter back to the vocalist who originally recorded the traditional chant that was heard by a traveling musician who recorded it, which was then re-recorded in another country, which was then mixed with a different style of music and published online, which was then in turn sampled by the artist that you are listening to now. Or if a restaurant could in some way benefit the woman in the middle of nowhere in Mexico who taught the American chef who founded that restaurant the fundamentals of making corn tortillas a decade ago, which then in turn set him on the path to develop the cuisine for which he later became famous. Some aspects of this type of model already exist today. There are rules about how royalties are shared with someone who has their work sampled in a new work, for instance though there are still times when that inspiration is highly debatable or left out of the financial picture. And let's be honest, much, if not most of the time, it's likely that the true inspirations behind a work would be left out of this type of cycle. Not intentionally, necessarily, but because every new innovation is the consequence of countless influences over the course of the creator's life. I have no way of knowing which of the visuals I've been exposed to over the course of my career are influencing me when I design a book cover? How can we expect a chef to remember every meal they've ever had, every lesson they've ever benefited from, every song they've ever heard, which might in turn be a part of that collection of strands that eventually wind together to create something new? How can we expect anyone to remember every single one of these details and record them in a usable fashion so that they can add that particular influence bead to the strand of influence for a particular work. It's possible we could come up with some kind of loosely enforced royalty mechanism, maybe based on something like the blockchain, variations of which essentially allow you to keep public records, which could help keep people honest. I'll link in the show notes to something called Ethereum, which is a good early model of something like this that could someday work in this fashion. It's also possible there could be a microtransaction element to this, which could help in the development of industry-specific influencer contracts. If you take this class that I am teaching, 
then any work that you create in this field in the future will automatically include me on a list of influences. Placement on that list might result in being credited in the album booklet for an EP, and maybe the influencer would earn a tenth of a cent for every dollar of profit that is earned from that EP. In this way, immensely influential people could eventually, conceivably, live off the knowledge and inspiration that they have shared with the world. It would be a tangible way to recognize the value that they have shared with other people and a means of compensating them for that. I don't know if something like this would be feasible or even desirable were it to prove possible. If you take this conversation meta enough, every single thing that we do is influenced by a million different things that we may not be able to recall consciously in the moment. But all of those things influenced who we are, the decisions that we've made and the thoughts that we've had. None of us grew up in a vacuum, away from all influences. And as such, even our very original seeming innovations, things that truly seem to be completely novel and which lack any obvious ancestors, were derived by filtering all of our experiences through the sieves of our minds. I'd like to think it's possible to give credit where credit is due while also enjoying the benefits of each community's unique experiences, contributions, and heritage. It may not be feasible at any time in the future, but something along these lines may help us avoid appropriation and help us orient globally towards something that's a little closer to a network of mutually beneficial cultural cross-pollination. If you are enjoying this show, there are many different ways that you can help support it. You can contribute monetarily through PayPal or Venmo. You can join the Let's Know Things Patreon, which is at patreon.com slash let's know things. So those are a couple of excellent direct options. You can also leave a review on iTunes, which is completely free and very, very helpful. If you take a moment to do that, that helps immensely in attracting new listeners to the show as does recommending the show to a friend who you think might enjoy it or sharing it with your social media following of choice. You can also check out our sponsors, which helps a great deal. The first of which today is Everlane, my favorite clothing company. Their aesthetic is minimal. Their build quality is amazing. This is meant to be the opposite of fast fashion, so you're not buying things to be trendy and then throwing it away. You are buying things that go with everything and that last, which I definitely appreciate. And if you go to letsnotethings.com slash Everlane, you'll be taken to their website and anything you buy, I will receive a commission for. So it's a great way to check out their offerings while also potentially passively, without having to pay anything extra, helping to support this show. That's letsnotethings.com slash Everlane. And the other sponsor today is Linda. If you go to letsnotethings.com slash Linda, L-Y-N-D-A, you will receive a free 30-day trial to Linda, during which you can watch as many of their courses as you care to, as many as you can fit into 30 days. And their library of courses really does run the gamut. They have a great deal of professional resources in particular, things that you might want to get certification for, different Microsoft software, Adobe products. If you've been meaning to learn Photoshop or learn how to take a better photograph or to use video editing software or to use your phone better or to do music production. There's a little bit of everything. And if you go to their site, you'll see what I mean. There's just gobs and gobs of different categories of videos that they have available. So if you are like me and you're always trying to pick up new skills to learn new things, to shine some light on new facets of the world, consider stopping by letsknowthings.com slash Linda, L-Y-N-D-A. The book that I would like to recommend today is A little bit strange, and I kind of hesitated actually to recommend it. It is a book that I decided to finally pick up and read. I think I skimmed it years ago, and it just didn't appeal to me, but several people I respect recommended it recently, so I decided to give it a go. And I listened to the audiobook version, which was perfect for reasons I'll get into in just a moment, but the book is called 48 Laws of Power, and it's by Robert Greene. And this is a book that the entire time I was listening to it, I was just thinking, God, I never want to hang out with this guy. I do not want to meet anybody who adheres to these laws of power. I do not 
want to be anywhere near these sociopathic, creepy as hell power mongers. And those feelings didn't stop me from listening to it. As I listened, I actually started to notice things, in some cases that I was doing accidentally without even thinking about it, and in other cases, things that people around me were doing. And it helped me recognize perhaps some of the motivations behind those things. And that, including the little story vignettes that are offered up as rationales behind these different laws, these different rules, these different suggestions toward acquiring power that are the basis of the book. That is why I would recommend listening to it or getting a copy to read with your eyeballs. It is valuable in some ways because you can be more aware of social dynamics. I would not recommend taking any of the advice in this book wholesale or taking it without a grain of salt. I would absolutely also, again, not recommend that you adhere to this book completely because you would become a social outcast and everyone would hate you immediately. It really is very, very creepy. And if you get the audiobook version, it's even creepier. As the narrator reads it, almost like he's a necromancer instilling in you secrets on how to raise the dead. Like he just has a very creepy voice and intonation. And it is somehow perfect that he sounds like some kind of dark sorcerer giving you forbidden secrets. It aligns perfectly with the content of the book itself. So that enthusiastic recommendation in mind, if you are looking for something interesting and potentially valuable to read, consider picking up a copy of 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Grab it at your local library, your local indie bookstore, your Kindle, your Kobo, wherever is most convenient for you. You can find out more about me and my work, including a full list of the books that I have written at colin.io. My blog is at exilelifestyle.com. And you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsnotethings.com. While there, consider signing up for the free newsletter, which goes out every Monday and is actually not so much a newsletter as it is a collection of interesting things that I think you should read. You can also feel free to say hello or follow me at Colin is my name on pretty much every social network except Facebook, where I am simply Colin Wright. Thank you so much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.